Welcome to Learn Extra Matric Revision. Today we're going to be covering history question one of paper one, looking at the, the Cold War and the influence that had in, in forming specific spheres of, of influence in the world during the 1960s and onwards. You'll notice that today is, is the first time that we are, are broadcasting the history, history program. Hence the, the need for me to, to, to wear a, a suit and tie to, to dedicate this specific occasion. So please excuse my, my formalness. And as we, we, we move on, hopefully you can spend some, some time relaxing with me and, and getting through to question, question one of the history paper. So if we can go and, and move on to, to the session. If you see down on the, on the border, I have here the, the impact of the, the Cold War. And there are a few things on a, on a checklist that are important for, for us to, to know. Firstly, the, the whole theme surrounds the, the idea of this creation of, a, of spheres of, of influence. Now, the influence comes from an ideological background of that versus capitalism versus communism. And the, the whole theme that, that we look at as we go in through, the, through this question, question one, basically surrounds those, those two ideologies. So everything that we, we look at will we'll go back to, to that specific theme. Underneath that, we have this whole uh, breakup of the, the economic, the political, and the, and the social conditions that, that happened because of this, this split in the, in the world at the, at the time. And the first one that we, we need to know and we need to, to look at is this whole idea of the, the two armed wings of, of the specific groups. The first one being NATO, if you see on the, the board here. NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and was basically the, the USA's the United States of, of America, should I say, it was, it was there to armed, armed grouping that was there to, to protect the, the ideas and ideals of, of capitalism against those of, of communism. Secondly, we have the, the Warsaw Pact, which was the USSR's response to, to NATO. That took into to account a lot of the countries that were, were placed in the, the European satellite states, we, we call them, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, who came under the, the influence of, of Russia, and, and together, obviously, we, we had the, the USSR. Then we have the, the Marshall Plan, which is another key point that we, we need to understand, not so much in, in what will be asked in, in this year's paper, but more of an understanding of when it comes to, to writing the extended writing, that we have an idea of, of where, where these ideas come from. So the Marshall Plan is, is one that we, we look at. You know that uh, General Marshall was involved in, in Europe on the United States side at the, the end of World War II. It was an economic recovery plan that was, was instituted for, or by the Americans for the, for the Europeans uh, to, to help them overcome the, the savages and the economic downfall after World War II. The Marshall Plan was obviously also given as a, as a way to prevent capitalism, uh, communism excuse me, from coming into to those countries that were devastated by the war. Comic-Con was a similar initiative implemented by the USSR, basically, it, which was an economic policy that involved itself and its, and its allies, which we've already mentioned, with the satellite states that existed in Eastern Europe. It tied them to, together in a long-term sort of plan. The third one, and probably to one of the, the more important key points that we, we need to understand as, as we move through this, this Cold War, War puzzle, is that of containment versus expansion. Now the containment comes in the, the idea that after World War II, with the advancement of, of communism and it really becoming a, a sort of an ideal that, that could replace capitalism for, for many countries and the conditions that they, they were in, the Americans as a, under President Truman at the time decided to, to put this idea of containing capital, I'm sorry, excuse me, of containing communism as opposed to, to allowing it to, to expand. Where obviously the USSR at the same time was trying to expand its influence around the, the world. So that would have, been, would have meant introducing communism into to more countries and obviously expanding their sphere of, of influence. The United States tried to, to garner that uh, by their policy of containment. And that is covered under the, the Truman Doctrine, which provided not only financial but also military 
and economic support to, to countries that signed in with the, the idea of staying a capitalist country and formed part of the, of the countries that would eventually form up the, the membership of, of NATO. Now, the whole thing that tied this two together, if we can carry on here, that this balance of power is an extremely important, important concept. And the reason that it's an important concept is that we know the Cold War never became a heated war, if we can use that, that term, between the, the United States and the USSR, between communism and capitalism. There was no physical battle that ever took place between those two, two superpowers. And the reason for that was this whole idea of mutually assured destruction. We know it as, as MAD, it will often come up in a, in a question paper, it will have the, the acronym, MAD stands for Mutually Assured Destruction, which basically because of the, the size of the, the military arsenals of both the United States and of, of the USSR, they basically balanced each other out. If there was one country that was, was dominant, there would have been or one superpower which was dominant, it would have overpowered the, the other one and there, there would have been a conflict that, that took place. But because they were on, on level footing with the, each other, that never ever turned into a heated war. So it remained a Cold War, hence the, the term that was used all the way up until the, the end of the 1980s. But please remember this idea of, of mutually assured destruction. It's governed a lot of policies of both the, the USSR premiers and the, the presidents of the United States. As I mentioned before, these two superpowers, although they never came into to contact with each other, they were involved with regional conflicts on a, uh, in all over the, the world, from Asia to, to Africa to the, to the Pacific and, and further on into to South, well, South America. Uh, the, the first one that we've, we've looked at, and, and you would have covered this when, when going through the, the curriculum in, in your own schools, would be that... Uh, the initial one in, in Korea, which, which happened in the, in the late 1940s, early 50s. Then we went into to Vietnam. And then finally, the, the USSR invasion in Afghanistan. Now, because those are, were regional conflicts that, that happened, the superpowers were not necessarily fighting each other, but they were supporting different groups within those regional conflicts. So, for example, in Vietnam, where we had the, the Viet Cong, which was a, a communist group, they were supported by the, the, the USSR. They were provided with training, they were provided with military weapons. Uh, America went in there to, to stop the Viet Cong from taking control in, in Vietnam because of their containment policy. They felt that Vietnam was the only or last vestige of, of capitalist control in, in Southeast Asia, and they wanted to, to hang on to, to that position. The USSR sponsored the, the Viet Cong to try to expel the, the Americans. Uh, eventually, we know that that was a, a long, drawn-out drawn out affair. But again, ultimately, what it came to, down to was this whole idea of, of mutually assured destruction, which meant that the, the two superpowers never t took that to a live conflict between themselves. For the, t for the, the past year and for the f future years, as, as far as we can tell at the, the moment, the specific section that we're going to be looking at when looking at these regional conflicts as a case study for question one will revolve around Cuba. Now, Cuba is probably the, the, one of the more important ones, not in terms of, of length, but in terms of when two superpowers, the United States and the USSR, came the closest to actually coming to, to a physical war situation. We will go, go through each of these, these points and you'll, you'll notice when later on seeing some of the, the questions from the last year's paper, we'll be looking at the, some of the extracts where that whole idea will, will come to how this actually almost turned into to a hot war. And to, to understand Cuba, we need to understand its history. And that goes back to the, to the Civil War, where Castro seizes power. Castro was a, was a socialist. He, he came and, and took control over, over Cuba when General Batista, he was in charge of, the, of Cuba leading up 1940s, early 19, 1950s. He was a, a pro-capitalist. He was supported by the, the Americans and he had close economic ties with the America. Castro was a, a people's, people's leader. 
uh, people's liberator. He had large support from the from the peasants and the the farmers that that lived in Cuba at the at the time. And this was a socialist takeover that took place in Cuba. After the the initial takeover by by Castro, a lot of of the capitalist elite in Cuba decided to to flee towards the United States. And that would eventually lead to the, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, which is again an important theme when looking at this whole idea of Cuba as a case study on the, on the Cold War. Now, to, to sum it up in, in a, to, as brief a way as, as possible, the exiles that, that left Cuba that were, were capitalists, they were supported in, in America by the Central Intelligence Agency, which we know as uh, the CIA. The CIA t trained them in the in the need to, to send them back to, to Cuba to cause another social revolution where the capitalists would then again take control. This plan by the CIA it had the full backing of, of President Kennedy at the, at the time. Eventually it was, it was repelled as, as Castro had got forewarning of the, of the, of the battle to, to take place. Uh, and ultimately it, it turned out to, to be an embarrassment for the United States and particularly Kennedy who had supported this, this takeover that didn't materialize. From that, we look at the, the relationship that existed between Castro and Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev was the, the premier of the, the USSR at the same time that, that Castro was, was in power. Khrushchev was wanting to, to form closer, closer ties with, with Cuba. It gave them an in into, into South America to, with regards to, to trade and the, the economic sort of benefits that would, would come from that. But not only that, there was a sort of deeper meaning for, for wanting to, to get involved with Cuba. Those of you that have, have seen a map of, of North America where the United States is, you'll know just below the, to the south of, of North America, we have the, the small island of, of Cuba. Now, at, at this point, there was no long-range missiles that were, were based in the USSR or any of its allies that could reach the United States. However, the United States, because of their, their alliances, particularly in, in Western and, and Central Europe, and specifically in, in Turkey, they had bases where they could launch military attacks against the USSR. Now, if we go back to the idea of keeping a balance and the idea of mutually assured destruction, this was a, a balance that was in favor of the United States to the detriment of the, the USSR. So it was very important for the, the USSR to readjust that, that balance. And the only way they could readjust that balance was to have a, a Soviet base that was close enough to, to the United States that if they were threatened, they could threaten the United States back because they had opportunities to launch ballistic missiles. They could, in fact, be carrying nuclear warheads and attack the United States. So those are one of the, the big themes that, that come out of this section. Then we look, uh, we take a close look at, at Kennedy. You need to know Kennedy, it's both his reaction to, to the initial disaster of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, and then also the, the building of, of missile silos by the USSR in Cuba it, itself. The Kennedy plays a, a large role in this. He becomes very aggressive to, towards, the, towards the Russians, who are the main players obviously in the, in the USSR. And he, he takes a, a leading role in, in trying to, to firstly repel what Khrushchev is, is doing in, in Cuba and then ultimately setting up a, a blockade that would take us to the, to the brink of, of possibly what could have been a nuclear war. So that refers to the, to the missile crisis. I've made mention already how the, the USSR saw Cuba as the ideal strategic position to launch missiles against the United States. So they started building these, these missile silos. Kennedy was, was able to, to take photographs from, from spy planes that, that, that were monitoring the, the situation. Kennedy had realized that there, there was USSR influence in Cuba and he wanted to know what was, was happening. So the spy planes were going over and they were taking photographs of these specific installations that were, were happening. As a result of those, those installations, we look at the American reaction and eventually a naval blockade is, is established around Cuba to stop the USSR ships carrying equipment, material needed to build these silos, and in fact the, the warheads and the ballistic missiles that they would have used to, to house at those silos, they put up this blockade, blockade to stop those USSR naval ships from, from coming through. Now that's conflict, you can imagine the, the whole USSR 
naval force carrying all the these weapons coming into contact with this this American blockade, which they've got their own military ships that are in their own position. And it took a, a last minute diplomatic effort to prevent those two countries from in fact firing on each other, which could have offset uh, a nuclear war at the time and would have been referred to as a third world war after the world had, had already been through World War I and II. So that took care of the, the naval blockade. And then finally, to, to understand this section properly, you need to understand the outcomes. What, were, what was ultimately achieved by, by this? Uh, it was found that, that, that Cuba it became a, it almost an insignificant role player it, again when the USSR left. What was the, the relationships like between the two superpowers afterwards? What were the steps put in place to avert a, a future nuclear war that, that could happen? All these things are, are things that you, you need to know when coming to, to answer this question. Although it doesn't come up often in the, in the source-based questions, you will need to, to know it when answering the, the extended writing. Uh, it's often a topic there, obviously a topic that we're going to be looking at a little bit later. And talking about source-based questions, I think the best way to, to deal with the type of questions that are going to come up and the, uh, the type of things that you need to be thinking about when, when answering the, the source-based questions is to physically tackle a, a few that have appeared in, in past papers. You need to, to remember that in the, in the paper setup as it stands at the, to the moment, the, each question is out of 75 marks. 45 marks of those come from the source-based question. So source-based questions are, are very important. The other 30 marks will come from the extended writing, which we will look at a little bit later. So to get right into it, and I tell, tell my learners this as well, to, please, if there's a tip I can give you, is read the sources first before answering or even looking at the, the, the questions. You'll have a, a good idea of, of what type of questions will be asked once you've read through the, the sources. But what I found in the, in the past, if you look at the questions first, and then you read through the sources, you tend to try to skim through and, and look for specific answers or key points that relate to, to the, the questions. And you sort of miss the understanding or the, the relevance that, that comes through from the, from the sources. So we're going to take a little bit of time in going through these sources, highlighting what is important. And then we'll have a look at the, the question related to, to that source. There's three sources that we'll be going through now. So without further ado, the, the first source we're going to be looking at as it appears on the, the screen in front of you as, as source one. It says at the top there, the source below consists of two extracts which focus on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now it's important to, to note, as soon as we see two extracts, so these are two extracts from, from people having a conversation or words that, are, that they have, have used. Immediately in, in my head, I'm starting to, to think they're either going to ask us to, to compare or in some way, use both sources is the one giving a different source to, to, the, to the first one. So those are the things that I'm immediately starting to, to think, and you need to start thinking like that as well. When looking at a, a source, again, before we even get started, and I've just read where the, where the source is, is from, before we even get, get started, there are a few things that we, we need to do to give the source some sort of context. And when I talk about context, we need to understand where in, the, in time does this source fit in? Uh, we know it's got to do with the, the Cold War. Uh, who is talking? Whose extract is it, is it from? Is there a date that is, is given that uh, assists us in, in putting it in, in context? There's a difference between talking about the United States in 1945 as opposed to the United States in the late 1970s. So we need to put these ideas into to context. So the information that we can grab straight away which is a relatively easy stuff, is firstly, as we go through extract one here, it says, Andre Gromko's view. Okay, Gromkos, okay, we know is the Soviet Union's foreign secretary. Okay, he was uh, the foreign secretary during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Without reading anything further, there are a few things that we, that we can take from, from that specific point. Firstly, we need to ask ourselves the question, what view is is Gromko coming across when he is making this, this extract? As a foreign secretary, who does he report to? These are the questions we need to, to be asking. It helps us to, to understand not only the, the context of the source, but also later the, the relevance, and then also to, 
as a key word that comes up in, in history all the, all the time is that idea of, of bias. Is this a one-sided view? Is he giving two opinions when he's, when he's talking? These are the things that we, we need to, to think about. So as we move down in this, in this first extract, I'm just going to read through quickly with you and then just highlight some of the important points. It says that the United States over several years had established offensive military bases around socialist countries and primarily near the USSR borders. So first key point here that we need to, to make note of is offensive. Now when we're talking about offensive, that is a attacking position. If we were talking the opposite, we were talking about a defensive position. So immediately offensive is explaining in his view the military bases that the United States have, have put up around perceived or known socialist countries. So immediately we, we start seeing this as uh, this is an aggressive talk towards uh, the United States. So it might help us a little bit later on when discussing the, the idea of, of bias. The placement of medium range effective Soviet missiles in Cuba was undertaken only after the United States ruling circles continued rejected proposals to remove American military bases. So the second point, point there is blaming America for the USSR's position. They're saying the only reason why Cuba became a, a possibility to install in a missile silo was the fact that America had already done this to the, to the USSR. So again, no blame is being taken by the, the USSR. So again, we have a, a case for, for discussing biasness. And already we can start thinking, yeah, that's probably one of the questions that, that will be coming up. And the, the final giveaway in, in our perspective, when looking at, at context, where does the source come from? It says, through Russian eyes. Yeah, President Kennedy's 1,036 days by Gromko. So this is through the, the eyes of the, the Russians, the USSR. This is how they perceive the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So keep that in mind just now when we're going through the, the questions. We did know that there were two extracts that were mentioned. The second one, okay, in 1984, Fidel Castro, there we got a date. Yeah, and then we got a person, just to help us with, with context, was interviewed by an American journalist, Tad Suzik. The journalist asked Castro why he was willing to allow Soviet missiles to be placed into Cuba or placed in Cuba. So that's to give us in context. 1984, that's some 20, to 20 years after the, the crisis happened. It's an American journalist interviewing Fidel Castro, who was leader of, of Cuba. Coming across, eventually we can immediately start thinking, how's, how's this journalist going to be, be writing this? And we'll see as we go through now, if he gives us any, any ideas or any clear indications that, that maybe this, this could be a little bit biased towards the American side. So firstly, it says that it was necessary to make it clear to the United States that an invasion of Cuba would imply a war with the Soviet Union. It was then that, the proposed, that they proposed the missiles. We preferred the risks, whatever they were, of a great tension, a great crisis, to the risk of the impetus, inability of having to await a United States invasion of Cuba. So Cuba, again, was saying that they were willing to, to accept the USSR ad advances by the USSR coming on, on board and providing the so-called muscle behind the, the Cubans. They alleviated the, the threat of invasion by the United States. If you recall, we go back to, to the whole idea of the, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The Cuba became very, how can we put it, they were very uneasy about the, the situation that America had already invaded them once before. Could the situation happen again? They felt that the situation was less likely to, to happen if the USSR had been involved in, in putting missile silos in, the, in Cuba and that if there was an attack on Cuba, and in fact it was a, an attack on the USSR. And going back to the whole idea of the mutually assured destruction, that would mean that in Farid Castro's eyes, when he gave this interview, that uh, there would be a banished remain and the United States would not attack. So the two extracts that we've, we've looked at, if we go across to the, to the questions. So question one, so this is referring to, to the, the two, two extracts. It says here, according to extract one, where did the USA establish military bases? As you can see in the... In the bottom right-hand corner of your, of your screen, 
you'll see there's a two times one and a two in brackets. Now the two, the initial two is for the number of facts that are being required. So you need to put two points down. For every point that you, you put down, or fact that you, you put down, you will get one mark. Okay, and then obviously that refers to, to the two marks. Question 1.1 is what we would refer to as a level one type of question. This is your simple questions. These are usually happen at the, at the beginning of each of the, of the sources, just to get you into to having read, to make sure that you've, you've understood what you've, what you've read, and to extract basic information from the source. So for example, it says according to extract one, where did the USA establish military bases? If we go back to what it mentioned at the, at the top here, it talks about that they're primarily near, again, let me get my pen out, primarily near the USSR borders and the socialist countries, around the socialist countries. So those are your two marks. You get one for socialist countries and one for near the USSR borders. If we go back to, to question one, and we move down to, to 1.2, why did the Soviet Union decide to place missiles in Cuba? Here we see it's for one mark again, or one fact, sorry, for two marks each. We would also consider this a level one question. Go straight back to the extract and withdraw the information. So it's asking us specifically here, why, is the important question, did the Soviet Union decide to place missiles in Cuba? So if we go back, we're still dealing with, with extract one, and it refers to this, this whole section over here. It says the placement of medium range effective, and sorry if you follow me here. It says the placement of medium range effective Soviet missiles in Cuba was undertaken only after the United States ruling circles continue rejected proposals to remove American military bases. So basically the information that we need to, to extract of why the USSR was, was wanting to, to build a, a missile silo over there was to do with the United States' uh, unwillingness to, to move their missile bases that were in range of, of Cuba. So that will give you the, the mark. And for putting that one fact down, you'll in fact get two marks for that. Here's a question that we knew was, was coming up because of the, the information and the, the context that we, we took the source from. If we look at question 1.3, it says, as a historian, referring to, to us as answering this, this paper, explain to what extent the information extract one may be regarded as, as biased. Now obviously to, to understand this question and to be able to, to answer this question, we need to understand what that word means. So if I was in a, in a class environment where I had the, the learners in, in front of me, I'd be in three, four, five, six different accounts of, of what bias is. But if we're just going to sum it up for, for ourselves here and for the purposes of, of what we're needing to do, we would say bias is a one-sided point of view, not taking into to account the other, the other side of the story for, for our moment and, and what we're trying to, trying to achieve here. You just need to know that bias is a one-sided view favoring a specific group. Not relative, well, not necessarily told on, on truth, and ultimately leaving out sections that, that wouldn't back up of what the, the statement was. So when we look back to, to extract one, there are a few things. Let's just get rid of all the, some of the other writing that's, that we've written all over the... Yeah, we need to, to come up with Three points, let's just make sure. Sorry, only one point is, is required. It says there, one fact. And for that one fact, we are going to get three marks. So if we go back, we need to find one reason to say that we consider this, this bias. And there are a couple that we, we can point to. Firstly, we can talk about, if we go back to, to the top here, we can talk about the author of the extract. The Russian Foreign Secretary, uh, we know that the, the Soviet Union, uh, they, they controlled the, the men that, that worked for them. So we would understand that he's not going to say anything that's anti-USSR. Chances are he does that, he's going to be recalled to, to the USSR to have to explain himself. So we immediately, just from that point, looking at the, the author of the extract. 
The second thing we, we can look at and that we can mention is that no blame was taken by the USSR for the, 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 the Cuban Missile Crisis to, to associate it into to one point. No blame was, was taken by them. They blamed everything on the United States. So again, I'm just seeing, seeing my, myself from maybe what was reality, and I'm only just focusing on the, the parts that, that suit me. So I'm only having a one-sided point of view, which illustrates bias. As a third point, if you, if you needed one, the title of the, of the book, Through Russian Eyes, again, as with the, the first example, it gives us this idea of one point of view, through the Russian eyes, not looking at it through the American eyes with a little bit of the Russian eyes, just through the Russian eyes. So any one of those would have given you the, the three marks as they appear over there. Then 1.4, comment on whether Castro was justified in allowing the USSR to place missiles in Cuba. This comes from Extract 2. They're asking us to, to look at Extract 2. Again, they're asking for two facts that will give you two marks per fact, which means four marks for, for this question. Now, the key point that we need to, to look at when answer, answering this question is what is it actually asking us to do? And in this case, it's asking us, is Castro justified in allowing the USSR to place missiles in Cuba? Justified, we understand to mean, is there a, a, a good enough reason why something has, has been allowed to, to happen? Or are the reasons that are given not good enough in, in terms of what we, we're discussing now? So if we go back to, to extract two, we are either looking for, for evidence that suggests, from Castro's point of view, that allowing the USSR into Cuba was justified. So if that's the argument that we're going to go with, we need to find. And we can find two points here. Firstly, at the, at the top, it says here, the United States, to the United States, that an invasion of Cuba would imply a war with the Soviet Union. It was then that they proposed the missiles. We preferred the risks, whatever they were, of a great tension, a great crisis, to risk of the impotence, inability of having to await the United States invasion of Cuba. So the two main points here that we can mention uh, is the first one there is that Cuba, if I can just highlight underneath there for you, would imply a war with the Soviet Union. I've got my big brother with me. If you're gonna, it's gonna pick on me, then you're gonna have to fight my big brother. In this case, I'm representing Cuba, and my big brother is the USSR. So that was one of the reasons that Castro used to, to justify the situation. The second one was that they'd rather do that, than as we see here, they preferred the risks, whatever they were, of a great tension, of a great crisis, to the risks of the impotence or inability of having to await the United States invasion of Cuba. So instead of hanging around on the chance that it might happen, it might not happen, this was something that was concrete. They knew if they had this in place that the United States would not risk an attack of, of Cuba. So those are two points that justify in the, in the mind of, of Castro why he allowed the USSR into to Cuba at this time. If we were to, to argue that there was no justification, we would have to, to look at, after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, that there was an international embarrassment that was, was caused by that fiasco, particularly on, on Kennedy, who as the President of the United States, in all chances would not risk a similar international scene to, to take place. So that the threat of actually attacking the United States, attacking Cuba, had diminished significantly by this, by this time. Those are the points that you would need to, to argue if you were saying that this was not justified. Easiest and most straightforward answer in this particular case is to say it's justified because we can use the information provided from the source. That's been a lot to, to take in for the, for the first half of it now. I think now's a good time to, to take a break. When we come back, we'll be having a look at, at question two and then moving on to, to both the paragraph question and then a quick look at the extended writing. See you after the break. Welcome back. We are to, to halfway through our, our session to today, and we're going to be moving swiftly on to, to question two before we start tackling some of the, the bigger stuff in the paragraph question and the extended writing. The next source that we're going to be, be looking at, you'll see at the top here, it says source two. Again, we want to be reading the, the source before we even start looking at the, at the questions. So let's go through, and let's remember to, to put our information into to context. So let's highlight those, those words and those information that we, we need that help us give relevance to the source. So firstly, it says at the top there, this was the main headline 
of the New York, New York Times. Hey, straight away, New York Times. I'm sure most of you know New York is in the United States. So we know this is a United States paper. So really, again, we're starting to think, maybe is this going to be a one-sided point of view? And then we can start looking at things like, like bias and possibly that a question would come up to, to justify that. The date is given as the 23rd of October, 1962, just prior to the, to the Cuban Missile Crisis becoming a, a major event. It highlights the USA's blockade of the Soviet missiles to Cuba. So this was prior to, to the intervention between Khrushchev and, and Kennedy, but it's after the, the blockade had already been, been set up. So really that gives us relevance to, to when this news, newspaper headline. I did mention that we could possibly be looking at, at bias, a one-sided point of view. You'll also know another word that, that comes up all the, all the time is, is that of propaganda. Now propaganda in the simplest form is the, the influencing of the way we think. And that could be done through advertising, through things such as newspaper to headlines. It's not changing the way we think, but it's influencing the way we see things and the, to, in any sense of, of what, we will, to, what emotions or what feelings that we will, will have. A more severe form, just, so, just to take it off, off note a little bit, of propaganda is that of indoctrination, which actually changes the way that we, that we feel about things. And this obviously happens over a longer period of time. But for, for this case, we, to, we could possibly be looking at propaganda and influencing our mind, specifically considering that this is a newspaper headline. So if we go on to the, to the paper, again, we see that it's the New York Times. Uh, all the other information we have already got from the, from the small blurb at the top. It says here, the U.S. imposes arms blockade on Cuba. On finding offensive missile sites, Kennedy ready for Soviet showdown. Now, if I was, I was reading that and I was an American, that would probably give me, just thinking about it in general, I'd feel yeah, a sense of, of pride. Hey, my president is getting ready for a showdown. Showdown implies that, uh, that there's some war that's going to happen, and that my leader is not afraid to, to partake in that. If we look quickly, just a couple of words that maybe bring a, a few emotions to, to the fore. Yeah, is the word offensive. Again, the opposite to that would be using defensive. They are not claiming that the, the Cubans have, have allowed the USSR into to Cuba to put up missiles as a defensive measure. They are saying this is an offensive measure. So this is a war measure. This is something that's going to lead to a, to a conflict. So looking down to the missile sites, Kennedy ready for Soviet showdown. So when we go back to the, the questions, first one there, it says 2.1. What message does the newspaper headline convey regarding the, the Cuban missile crisis? Yeah, we, we're again looking at, at one mark, if I get my pen working out, we're looking at one fact, sorry, for two marks. So this is a, a level one question. It's, again, this is just something that we can extract. So if we go through this quickly, what message does the newspaper headline convey regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis? If we go back to yeah, the headline, we would say it basically it's showing that, that Kennedy is ready to, to take on the, on the conflict. If I can highlight the, the answer in, in purple here. We talk about the, the Soviet showdown, okay, based on the finding of offensive, offensive sorry, missile sites. So that is the information that we're getting from the headline. If we go back to question 2.2, it says, how did the New York Times portray President Kennedy? Keyword here is that of portray. When you portray someone, it's how they put across. How is Kennedy put across due to the information shown in the, in the headline? If we go back to, to the source, uh, we see the only mention of Kennedy is right at the end over here. I'll just move that down. It says, Kennedy ready for Soviet showdown. Again, it shows us a leader that is not willing to, to stand back. The fact that it talks about a showdown shows that uh, Kennedy is willing to, to go into to a fight. So it shows the inspirational leader willing to, to, to take the necessary actions. That is what we're going to put down as the answer to 2.2. And then the last question in this section, it says, explain how a devoted Soviet citizen would have responded to the newspaper headline. Here we're looking at two marks for two questions. Uh, so excuse me, two facts required for two marks each 
will give us a total out of four. So going back to the to the newspaper headline, let's just get rid of some of this other stuff that we've really looked at. Yeah, now if I was a, a Soviet citizen, these are the things that are to, would find it difficult to, to bear. First here, I'd be upset that they referred to offensive missile sites. Offensive, again, means that the, the USR are the, are the aggressors and that this is not a defensive measure. Secondly, that they refer to, to Kennedy ready for a Soviet showdown. I could argue the fact that this is in fact a, an example of, of propaganda against, a, against Russia and the, the USSR. So those are the, the two feelings that if I was answering this question, those are the ones that I would, I would put down. So that was a, the last question that we are going to look at, specifically the, the sources, uh, the one-on-one -on -one question per source. The, the next two, two ones we're going to tackle are looking at the, at the paragraph and the extended, extended writing. And the first one we're going to be, be going to is question three, if I can bring you down to, to the board. This is a, the paragraph question. Now we know for the, for the source-based questions in all the, in all the papers that you, you're going to be answering, there, there, is that there will be one paragraph question. The things that we need to, to look at is that it's asking us to, to go through all the sources. It's asking us to, to write a, a paragraph of about eight lines. Uh, they're giving us uh, the, the market of, of 80 words. And the question that it's asking is explain the impact that the Cuban Missile Crisis had on Khrushchev's political career. Now for a second, I want you just to, to forget about the, to what is actually being asked. And let's focus on, on how we're going to be answering this, this question. We have got the, the information we need. We know we need to go back and look at all the sources. We know that we're looking to, to write between 8 to, to 10 lines. And they've given us a, a guideline of 80, 80 words. The thing we need to remember that this is marked off a, a rubric. Now the rubric counts for, for three levels, going from, t in this case, going from 0 to, to 2, then from 3 to, to 5, and then from 6 to 8 to finish off. And that is a rubric that will be used to, to mark this specific paragraph question. So going back to, to what it's specifically asking, it says, yeah, explain the impact that the Cuban Missile Crisis had on Khrushchev's political career. So if we go back to the, to the, the sources, Okay, we look at the, the two extracts that were, were given at the, the top, extract one, extract two, and we look at the New York Times, the headline that was, was given. Those are the sources that, that we, we're dealing with. Now, to answer this question specifically, we need to, to ask ourselves, was there only a negative impact on Khrushchev's political career? Or was there a positive one too? And the real answer when dealing with this is yes, that there was a positive and it's a negative. We just need to, to make sure that when we're writing, we're formatting this in the correct style, that it's written in a, in a paragraph form. One tip I can give you is that if you put it into to bulleted forms, where, it, for example, if I can show you on the, on the screen, uh, you put a bullet, which denotes a, a point that you're gonna make, uh, and you talk about the, the positive, and then you put a, uh, another bullet, uh, bullet, uh, bullet point, and you talk about the, the negative. A person who's marking that, that paper at the end of the year is not going to read it. Please, it needs to be set out in the, in the correct format. And the correct format for, for a paragraph is that you have an establishing sentence. Your opening sentence is going to describe, and in this case we'll say, by looking at both the, the positive and negative influences that the, that the sources that were given to us had on, on Khrushchev's career, we're going to be, be highlighting some of those uh, with the eventual outcome where we give our point of view. Uh, ultimately, it was negative. Uh, he was fired. He lost his job. Or ultimately, it was positive, And he is remembered by all of us as being a, as one of the great statesmen of the, of the Cold War because of his diplomatic stance that he took when dealing with Kennedy. If I can go down, I'm not going to go through all the, the points with you. You can get this information. From, from all your, your textbooks, any notes that, that you've been given through, throughout the year and what we've already discussed in today's lesson. This is a model answer. Again, please 
just because I'm showing you the, the model answer does not mean that you are allowed to put it in bullet forms. But the establishing point is your establishing sentence. Yeah, we'll include what you're going to talk about. So let me highlight in your opening sentence in green. You're going to be talking about the positive and negative impact that the missile crisis had on Khrushchev's political career. Then your second sentence and probably third sentence, you're talking about the, the positive, the good things that, that happened because of it. Your fourth and fifth sentence, you'll be talking about the, the negative. And then finally, your sentence after, after that, any other information that you've picked up from the, from the sources, yeah, we'll go into that, that final sentence. Paragraph done, start of eight marks, it will be marked off a, off a rubric of three levels, uh, depending on the information you've, you've given, will count for the majority of those marks, but obviously that you've set it out in the, in the right format, uh, will count for the, for the rest of the marks. They marry that up to, together, and the person marking your, your final paper at the end of, your, of the year will give you a mark out of, out of eight. But please, again, no bullets, make sure you set it out correctly and you are writing one paragraph. Because if you've started again to, to a page length, you have gone too, too far and you're only wasting your, your own time. If we can go on to, to, to question four. It says here, answer one of the following questions, question 4.1 or question 4.2. Now the, to, the options that they always give you, the first essay option will be a, a straightforward. Uh, this is information that, that you need to know. It's going to ask you to take a stance or to, to, to take a point of view or to have an argument. The second essay question will always be looking at the, at the sources to come up with an argument based on the sources that are, are provided. The important thing that we, we need to, to remember, and I stress this to, to my learners all the time, is that you need to plan. If you consider that uh, essay is going to take you between half an hour and 45 minutes to, to write, uh, at least half of that, that time needs to, to be spent on proper planning. If you, if you plan correctly, that you'll find that writing the, the essay world will go quickly and, and smoothly. And we know that uh, essay matrix that is, or extended writing, excuse me, matrix that is, is used is a matrix out of, of 30, where half the, the marks is for presentation and the other half of the marks are, are for content. So if we get this right from the, from the offset, there's no reason why we cannot achieve at least a, a mid to, to high 20s mark just that we've set it out correctly and have got the majority of the, the facts together. If I can draw your attention to, to the board here, there are a few important things that, that we need to discuss very briefly, not so much on the, on the content of, of these type of essays, but how we're going to be setting them up. Firstly, what I found that, that has worked in the, in the past is that we, we take this topic, Again, it's asking, explain how the USSR and the USA contributed to Cold War tensions in Cuba. Now, from that, we need to, to do the, the following as far as our planning goes. I call them establishing points. Uh, you might call them point one, point two, point three. These ultimately are the main focus points of the, the essay. What you'll be doing with the extended writing, what you'll be doing with these points later on, they will become the, the first opening sentence of your, your paragraph, and then according to, to your planning, that information is what is going to be shifted underneath into that, that paragraph. So most paragraphs, or extended writings, excuse me, we can find between three and possibly six at a maximum establishing points. If you've got less than three, you haven't planned correctly. If you've got more than, than five, six, uh, you, you've gone to, to too much detail and you need to, to cut back. So to, for this essay, establishing point number one, okay, we would basically look at the USSR's contribution to Cold War tensions. So that would be your establishing point number one, focusing on the USSR. Let's go for another color. Let's go for yellow. Establishing point number two, we'd be focusing on the, the USA, again also contribution to Cold War tensions in Cuba. The third one that we could highlight is Cuba itself, 
yeah, what, what ultimately brought these, these two superpowers involvement in, in Cuba. Uh, and then establishing point four, try to find a, a color that will stick out. Obviously, my planning is, is all in a, in a circle here. You would have it set out in a, in a much more formal, formal way. But basically, that's establishing point four would be the outcomes, how the situation was averted, for, for example. So once we've identified our, our establishing points, we then go and put the information that each of those are going to carry. So for example, we were talking about the, the USSR contribution to Cold War, War tensions. That is uh, the point in, let's just get back to, to our yellow pen. That's the one we, we're talking about, sorry, our green pen. It shows how neat I'm doing this. Focusing specifically on the, on the USSR, there we will talk about the USSRs wanting to, to get a foothold close to, to the United States, wanting to, to re-establish what we discussed before, this idea of a balance in the, the world because of the mutually assured destruction, and wanting to have a, a trading partner or an economic stance in South America. So that would be initially why the USSR went into to that region. Uh, America, we would be looking at the initial response to Castro taking over with the Bay of Pigs fiasco, and then also what was the response when the USSR moved in? Uh, what was Kennedy's response? All those things we would be mentioning under establishing point two. Establishing point three, looking at Cuba, would be identify how we got to the situation in the, in the first place. And if we were planning this uh, correctly, obviously your establishing point three would be the initial one that we, we put in. So ultimately, once you've got your, your four establishing points, if I can go down a little bit, obviously this is a history lesson, not, a, not an art lesson, so it's, uh, no commentary on, on what we, we write in here. So firstly, it's, uh, our first paragraph when writing the extended writing, is going to be the introduction. Hey, again, we don't write introduction. Hey, we, we just put the, the name of the number of the, the question down. Our introduction will include all our establishing points. So we will be talking in our current example, we'll be looking at firstly the USSRs, how they contributed to tension, the United States contribution to tension, Cuba, how it, it contributed to getting these superpowers together in the first place, and then ultimately what was the, the outcome. All of those establishing points will now become grouped together in an introductory paragraph. So you write your, your paragraph, Yeah, within those paragraphs you'll have your establishing point one, two, three, and four. Just mention these are the things that we're going to talk about. Your first paragraph, therefore, will be establishing point one. I'm writing it in here so you can, can see it. Again, we're not allowed sentences, or sorry, we're not allowed headings when writing ex extended writings. So please don't underline anything when you are doing your, your, your practical section here and you're actually writing your, your neat copy out. No headings allowed. Another tip, no bullets, no shortening of, of information. Extended writing refers to, to, to the paragraphs and the correct content and presentation. So establishing points, uh, you'll write, write your three or four lines based on the, the information that you put under your planning. Then your establishing point two, establishing point three will all become their own paragraphs as we did in establishing point one. And uh, ultimately we'll have establishing point four that we will write. And then finally after that, we've got our conclusion. Now our conclusion is to tie up our line of argument. So basically that we mentioned establishing point one, the USSR's contribution to, to tensions in, in Cuba, the person that's going to be marking your final paper wants to see that it's been mentioned in your introduction. There's a line of argument that follows it where it's explained. And then and ultimately it is mentioned again in the conclusion. And I hope that uh, everyone understands that. The line of argument is that you spoke about what you were going to discuss in the extended writing. You then explained why you were discussing it with all the, the reasons that you, you put in your planning. And then you mentioned it to close it up again at the end of the essay. So for example, in this case, you, you would say using establishing point one in your conclusion, having looked at, at the USSR's contribution to the, to the tensions, uh, we can see that ultimately they were responsible uh, however you want to, to end it up. Here's my last tip, 
before we, we have to, to close off to today, is that you're not writing a, a thriller novel uh, where we have to wait till the, to the last line to say who actually committed the murder. That is not the point of the extended writing. A lot of the boys that I, t I teach, they get to, to the end and then they think it's some big unveiling at the, at the end of the extended writing when they finally give out the, the truth or the information that they're trying to be withhold. There's nothing that is mentioned in the conclusion that you have not yet mentioned in your paragraph and ultimately in your introduction. So on that note, I'd like to, to wish you all the, all the best. I hope that you, you found this, this session in, informative and I look forward to, to seeing you again sometime. <laughs>